This is Annabelle Gaberti and you are listening to Lawfully Creative, my podcast to talk with professionals in the creative industries, to hear their stories, what inspires their creation, what decisions change their careers, what relationships influence their work. Today's episode is brought to you by Crefovi, our London and Paris-based law firm focused on advising the creative industries. Subscribe to our podcast Lawfully Creative or catch up with our original shows on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Podcasts, SoundCloud, CastBox, TuneIn, Breaker, Radio Public, Anchor, Pocket Casts, The ABA Journal, Player FM, iHeartRadio and Overcast. Please do leave a review and rating about our podcast to encourage others to discover our curated content. On the 26th of November 2018, I drove from hay on wye which is a village quite far away from everything in Wales, and I went to the Welsh Lavender's Farm, who is owned by Nancy Durham and her husband, in an even more remote place in Wales. And that was just after the um, Hay Winter Festival, which I had been attending for the whole weekend. I, um, I went to um, Nancy's um, as I met her during prior sessions of the Hay on Wye Festival, I think around two years ago. Nancy uh, and the team manufacture, distribute and um, sell some uh, really, really high quality balms and creams and lip, lip creams and uh, other beauty products which are mainly uh, made out of lavender and they are delightful. I use them all the time and everywhere I am in the world. So the quality of these products being uh, so high and Nancy being such an interesting, uplifting and um, creative person, I went to her farm um, in, as I was saying, in a very remote location, I mean, at least for me, uh, who lives mainly in London and Paris, um, in Wales. And so we registered this podcast to talk about her trajectory from uh, um, uh, Canada, where she was born, to uh, the UK, and reinventing herself, so to speak, as a as a beauty entrepreneur after a um, successful career as a, as a journalist and broadcaster. So here is my interaction and uh, conversation with uh, Nancy Durham from Welsh Lavender. Hello, welcome to my farm. You are in the middle of Wales, up high on a hill at 1100 feet. Anyway, I was babbling too much. So no, just, no, 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 it's okay. Start. So, so, so you were saying um, um, we we just had a problem with the, uh, with start the podcast, over. and yeah. and um, and so I'm I'm going to backtrack here. Sorry. Don't worry, just start start again um, in some other way. And we'll... So you were telling me that um, as the, um, the the founder of the of Welsh Lavender Limited and the farmers brand, um, you came here uh, with your husband Bill in. Um, um, 84? If I well, my husband bought our farmhouse that we're sitting in in 1974 yes. when it was derelict. It hadn't been lived in for decades. Okay. I mean, there was no stairs going up there. The roof was missing. Uh, and uh, it was still being used as a place for cows to be born and wow. sheep were wandering around. So it was completely open. And um, he started fixing it up in 1974. And lucky for me, I didn't meet him until 1981. So, oh, by, yeah, the, yeah, so by the time I came to visit, it was quite good. There was running water. You couldn't drink it. There was no electricity. And all the heat came from the fireplace. It was incredibly romantic. There was a lot of can, sure. candle wax everywhere because that was the means wow. of light at night. Wow. It's re- beautiful. Okay. I was instant, instantly seduced by this yes, I place. Can, I can understand that. It's, it's, it's a... There's a lot of uh, peace and quiet in here. So, um, sorry, um, so you were saying that you were born in Toronto, but at two or three years old, you relocated with your family, obviously, uh, close to Lake Ontario in a small town called Oak... Oakville. Oakville, yeah. okay, which was... Oakville. Oakville, sorry, yes, which was quite close to um, to the countryside in itself. Well, it was this very small town on Lake Ontario, very pretty, very wealthy, and our house was on, right on the edge of town, so we were in a... We were in a 
beautiful neighborhood with streets and we had our bicycles to ride around on, but just behind the houses were fields and fields where we could run and play and sneak away and get up to trouble and adventure and things. So, I mean, it was a very sort of on the edge of the, it was very sort of country existence. Exactly. But so. not for long, because everything else since then has been oriented towards cities and towns, except for now here in Wales. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so in a way, coming here, it reminded you a bit of your early childhood memories and... No, I. You know what? I. I think I feel that that I was misleading. No, this place reminded me of nothing. Really? I just when I came here to visit for the first time, August 1981. I was just stunned by the the beauty, the views, purity of the cut. Well, the color, the color, the green, the patchwork fields. I mean, here we are, high on a ridge, looking down the valley and across to another ridge, mm -hmm. and in the distance, rolling hills. It's it's magical. I don't think there is a prettier place yeah. in the world. Yeah. Okay, the weather is a problem. There's all kinds of things like that, but I am in love with this um, this location. I, I can understand that. Um, then you told me you went to university, and um, sorry, that's uh, that's where you you uh, in 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 the Canada. Uh, I, I I did. Yeah. I studied. I studied at. Um, I got two degrees: an undergraduate degree and a master's degree from York University, York, where which was, is on the edge of Toronto. Okay in a very pretty ugly suburban end of the city. But a great university, mm -hmm. great big campus, and I had uh, wonderful years there. So um, are you um, are you familiar with French language or Quebecois, or is that not something? Yeah, I, uh, my parents, to their credit, sent me to French lessons when I was a very little girl, and I learned how to say, you know, comment ça va, ça va bien, quel âge avez-vous, quel nom avez-vous, je me lève, je m'assieds. But I didn't learn how to converse about anything, and it was because it was just on its own. It wasn't immersion, so my French is m embarrassingly poor. Oh, it was very kind of them. But it was good, and it was great that they did so it. But it, but it was be before the day that we all learned. If you want to learn learn a language, be immersed in it. My stepdaughters oh, were yeah. immersed in it, and as a result, um, they would deny it. But they can speak pretty good French. So I'm I'm I, I don't know. I'm not a linguist, but I am studying Welsh. Oh, you are? I'm working on that. Oh, that's a very difficult language. I mean, when you think that police is called Ledlu in Welsh, there is absolutely no heavy, resemblance. Heavy. Okay, sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. Uh, there is no resemblance. I was seeing this on the policewoman yesterday when I was at yeah. the Hay Festival. There's nothing uh, that can, you know, uh, uh, remind you of vaguely even of the word police in uh, in Hedley. <laughs> it's, no, it's it's true. It's true. But I, I can tell you, um, Dwayne Hoffy Dusky shared Kamrag, which means... I like studying speaking Welsh. Do you? I do, but it's it's very difficult. But it, yeah, really, the difficulty is the words are so extraordinary. But apart from that, they're they're all in a row. You know, um, Dwi'n Shopa means I'm sh I'm shopping. I'm going shopping. Okay. I shop. Okay. There aren't all lots of different ways of saying it the way there are in English and French. Okay, so. Anyway. Yeah, but there's no Latin root at all in there, so I, I would be totally I am totally lost in that. Pont, they have pont pont is bridge. As in French, ah, P O N T, ah, right? You say pont, pont, ah, do you? Okay. Ah, right, pont. yeah, yeah. Which in Italian would be ponte. Yeah, ponte. Fair, fair so enough, there are there enough. are some connections, and you see the sign around here, pont vine, which mm -hmm. is weak bridge. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah. To know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you mentioned that you moved in the UK in in uh, to the UK, sorry, in nineteen eighty four. That's right. Yes. Uh, was that because your husband had uh, relocated here? Is is Canadian well, as well? Bill is Canadian. He I met him in nineteen eighty one, and we started. I was in Toronto. He was teaching at Oxford. He's a philosopher. Okay. And so uh, Oxford's not portable, but journalism is. Mm -hmm. So we yeah. we courted back and forth, and finally in nineteen eighty four, I moved over to be with him and to see if I could make it as a journalist here. So we. We, we, I moved in with him in Oxford, we got married a few years later, we're still married, and all these years, decades have gone by. Wow, gosh, I don't know how that just... happened. And the stepboard daughters that you mentioned, yes. what, 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 was this his... Uh... They're his da daughters, my stepdaughters now, and so they were raised in Canada by their mother, but we had summer holidays with them and some Christmas holidays with them, Okay. and so they were always like on the scene, coming and going. Okay. And, yeah. I understand. But they were born in Oxford and raised here before uh -huh. they were taken there. So by making money. Yeah. Okay. Um, so thank you for reminding me that you were a journalist. Actually, this is quite prominent on your on your Wikipedia profile. Were you into uh, uh, covering some sort of war zones and stuff? You, I have the impression you were really much on the field. I was in love being in the field. Uh, first, as a radio reporter. Okay. I covered the breakup of uh, not, well. 
the USSR in a way. I, I was in Czechoslovakia a lot. I was there for the uprising and the fall of the communists. It was the most exciting assignment of a lifetime in 1989 and into 90. Mm -hmm. But I was there for the years before too, coming and going and getting to know that place when it was still quite tightly controlled. And, and then I, I covered in radio all around uh, East Germany and Romania and all around Central Europe, you, a bit of Russia. Ex ex yeah, yes, countries. yes. But Why? Uh, well, I go Did in another direction. Uh, Bill, <laughs> Bill, my husband, the philosopher, he was involved in trying to um, go to back up a little bit. The educate the academics in uh, under the communists in Prague in Czechoslovakia, all across the country, really suffered. A lot of them were thrown out of the universities, and they got jobs instead building the new underground or stoking fires oh, in the really basements. In China and the, oh, and, well, and the, and maybe a little parallel. as well. So they uh, were deprived of their, you know, their academic intellectual life. Terrible. Uh, formerly, yeah. So Bill uh, was one of the first of a group of people from Oxford who went to give lectures unofficially in philosophers' flats. So you'd meet on Saturday night, you'd give your philosophy of science paper or whatever it was, and these dozen people would have the advantage of talking to somebody who wasn't from their city, who was doing maybe a different kind of philosophy, but to have a good stimulating discussion. That's and, dangerous, though. Well, Bill was uh, uh, the the flat where he was giving his lecture was raided, and in 1980 he was tossed out of the country, and he, so he couldn't get he back in again. He oh was expelled, God. which was a great thing for the Czechs to do because it shone a light on the problem, and out of that grew a whole underground university. Not just him, but he was one of the key players who made this happen just by accident, almost. So. Bill had all kinds of fantastic contacts that he couldn't use, so I used them. So okay. I went. I started going to Czechoslovakia because it was a place I knew about through him, and that just began a love for working in difficult places. Yeah, for sure. And, and then to fast forward, um, I became one of the first video journalists, one man band, going around covering stories in the world for television by myself with a small really? camera. Really? Little camp, little video camp. First it was a high eight camera, then it was a digital video camera. Uh -huh. And what were you using? I was red? Oh God. Well it was a Sony something or other number. Okay. I mean I used several. Okay. But in the end, I mean they were really they were still quite big but yeah. small. Not but nothing like these tiny things they have today. And w that was my ticket to cover the world. And one of the you know the big story of the um 90s was the breakup of Yugoslavia. Okay. So I covered it from almost every corner. Well, that that led to the conflict between the Serbs and the Croats, no? The uh, breakup well, they of were, Yugoslavia. Yeah, they, then it was already breaking up. Oh, okay. I, I cover. I was in Serbia. I was in um, oh, you were very Bosnia. I was in Croatia. Yeah, covering covering them. The kinds of stories I did were newsy, but what you'd call current affairs. So I wasn't doing like, the news of the day, but the longer take afterwards to show what happened to the family of Subashic family who might be take, sent from their uh, uh, Serbia to go and live in another part of the of the Balkans that was being so-called ethnically cleansed. Ooh. So I covered the... Were they famous, the Subashis? Or? No, she, I just picked a name. She's a great girlfriend of mine. Okay, it, was like the Serb, it was a Serb name that came into my head. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, okay. So, you know, Serbs were... Well, Serbs were sending uh, Croats out of Serbian territory and Croats were sending Serb Serbs out of Croatian territory, and you just had this great big jumble of people, very cruel, very ugly. Mm -hmm. I traveled in a hay wagon with some women who were expelled from Croatia. They happened to be Serbs. They were being sent to Serbia, where they'd never been. They, they might have been Serbs, but they didn't see themselves living in Serbia. So they left everything behind, their homes, they had to. their wedding albums, their dog, their pets, their neighbors, and went to go to live someplace else. I traveled with them and witnessed that and kept in touch with them and saw what happened to them next. So it was an extraordinary time for reporting and meeting people and following up with them. It's very... You remind me of this uh, American, I think she was an American um, journalist who covered the Second World War, and then she got married to this English chap, and they decided to live in the countryside, uh, and um, there was an, in very uh, sadly her name um, is elapsing me at the moment, but there was an extremely interesting retrospective of uh, pictures at the um, War Museum, 
in the south on the south she side. was a photographer yeah american um, uh, i think she was american born and um yeah you remind me of, of her a little bit because then she decided to settle in the countryside but i don't think she fared very very well because i think she had uh, some bouts of depression as well especially when a, a child was born um and um then it, the, the work that she did as a, as a journalist was fantastic hopefully i will uh, later on remember her name because she was a fa it. very famous yeah. female well, photographer I, I i think that just since you're interested in this, I, I feel very lucky because doing the video journalism thing on my own allowed me to report a little bit differently to the television reporter who went out with the crew yeah. and did like wonderfully crafted pieces for television. Mine are rather rough at the edges. Uh -huh. But I did get that chance to go. I always, We called it under the radar because I was out there very inexpensive for the CBC, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, uh -huh. to send me out there. Editors didn't really worry where when when was when was I filing the story? I didn't have to file that day or the next day. So typically, I would mm -hmm. go out for a week, say to Kosovo, Albania, gather lots of material, and bring it back to London for editing. And so that was a, a privilege and a, a luxury because mm -hmm. you could actually meet people and spend time with them, nice. and not always be just filming, 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 interviewing. Yeah. It was a very exciting. So in that sense, I think I got to work like some of those great reporters who went around with their notepad or their camera on their own mm -hmm. and um, got great stories. I'm not comparing myself to myself to them, but it was a, a very free way of working. Yeah. yeah. Is that, was that your main client, the CBC, or were you, were you self-applied or were you... Mo mo most of my work was for the CBC, but I also worked for the BBC. I got stories onto um, Channel 4 News, okay. which was very exciting, wonderful place, people to contribute to. Did you have to change your accent when you were working for the BBC? No, but the BBC, the BBC I think it was it was too bad about my accent because it was very limiting. I mean, love that. No, no, it was a problem. No, no, it was a problem. It, it, it was a problem like for them. Brand. Yeah, it was a problem for them. Was it? Yes, it was. Well, no, no, it was. And in fact, the, the, the place I could work most easily was Woman's Hour, but only when, usually when I was abroad, they didn't mind having my acts. They preferred it when I was sort of sending them something from Sarajevo. Somehow you're out there in the international world. I think. I mean, eventually I got, I was a real part of their team and I did get to do some very exciting British stories. Oh, I, yeah. I would be asked. The but the accent was a problem. I couldn't, I tried to get a job in news when Radio 5 was launched and I was told, I got to the end, of, I think I was the last one, on the, the one that they thought they would have, but they couldn't because of my Canadian accent. Wow. Wow. And I also saw that, um, I mean, this is on your Wikipedia profile, so perhaps it's, uh, uh, you, you, you need to uh, 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 update it <laughs> update it, or check that, w tell us whether it's true, but you also worked for Monocle, uh, the oh. Tyler Breeze brand as well. Yeah. As, a, as a, well, Tyler launched a, um, his 24-hour radio, um, internet radio station, Monocle, Monocle 24. 24. Yeah. And I, I, he asked me to help teach his print reporters from the magazine how to do radio. So I did that. Well, like some time ago then. Yeah, when the mag when, when the radio was launched, help, was it eight years ago, seven years ago, something like that? It's such an yeah. kind So of I, I went in and did that, and I had a ball, and Tyler said, well, why don't you present some programs? Mm -hmm. So I presented lots of programs fairly regularly. Right. And um, I haven't the last couple of years. I'm still on the masthead. And I'm very thrilled to be. And I just what have to... What do you mean, the masthead? The masthead is that... And you open the oh, magazine, yeah. and it, says, it tells all about who's Sorry. in the magazine. No, no. And then it tells Radio uh, Monocle 24 presenters, there's Nancy Durham. It still says that. So I have to go in and earn that and present a program one of these days. Do you have to physically be very yeah. variable and high? Uh, I mean, in the Midori house? You go, I go there. You have to be there. But physically. I know, but I had this idea, maybe I should have a studio in Wales, and I could just yeah. be here. Hello. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, but even for them, for them, but for for some other anybody. Yeah, because now it's so cheap, you know, to uh, to to broadcast. I think that uh, with the technologies we have today, so I think that, that sounds like a great idea. Um, Tyler, did you hear that? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and so, is it for your connection with Tyler that um, because he also has a, um, a, a a branding agency, or maybe like a consultancy mm -hmm. agency, which does in, among other things branding? Yeah, is it through this connection that this uh, project of creating your Cosmetics and uh, uh, perfume brand um, farmers uh, managed by the company uh, Welsh Limited uh, uh, created a, a burgeon or or how did you transit really from being a full time um, in the field journalist to farmer a, a, a farmer and entrepreneur? Well, okay, absolutely 
accidentally. Oh. Initially, nothing to do with Tyler. Um, okay. I. It was a real. It's complete. This is a business story that is an accident, and in many ways still is. In 2003, I mentioned to a farmer neighbor that I wanted to plant some lavender, and that was because Bill and I had lived in an Oxford manor house owned by the university, and it had a lavender hedge. I thought, wouldn't that be lovely to replicate here? Wow! So the farmer was really interested in this and asked me a lot of questions about lavender. I couldn't answer them because I was not even a gardener at that point. So um, I'm so sorry, yes. but was that was that wedge was the farmer located in Oxford or was it was he from here? Here, right here. We were sitting here, okay. just were out this window. And you had started to plant some lavender. No, 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 no. We were just so having much. a drink. Okay. And having a, and I said I want to you know, you over a drink. I want okay. to do this, I want to do that. Right. So Baden was the farmer neighbor, he lives a couple of hills that direction. Okay. Um and he came back a couple of weeks later and said, I bet if you applied to the government uh, through its GLASI program, GLASI is uh, Welsh for to green, they were trying to get farmers to diversify, uh -huh. he said, I bet you'll get a grant, because the story is farmers aren't applying for the money. Is that a Welsh grant or an EU grant? Both. EU, thank you very much, and Wales, together, very much. It would not have happened without the EU. And so I thought it was a crazy idea. First, I was a journalist working full-time. I'm not a gardener. I don't know anything about lavender. But mm -hmm. who doesn't love a challenge? And it's sure. it was very different to my this daily world I was you know reporting in. Yeah. So I did research and discovered that lavender could grow here. There were some very hardy varieties. Yeah. And that you know we had the land I applied for and got 1,000 pounds, which almost covered the cost of planting a very tiny field, the one I showed you up behind the house. One Grant was it one, enough? We were, almost. Okay. So it wasn't. Okay. It wasn't like a money making proposition. Okay. It, it was just. It, it, it was a little help, a little bit of help. Yeah, uh, yeah. But but without that help, I don't think I would have. I wouldn't have done it. I mean, I could have spent a thousand pounds on planting lavender, but this was really answering the call of the government. What 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 else could grow here? Yes. So I thought, let's Fair show, enough. and it did. And we did nothing with it, except for in the summer, admire it, cut it, hang it to dry. There's a bunch over there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then we sold it in uh, local markets just for fun. You're never going to make any money selling uh -huh. dried bunches of lavender. Years went by, and someone came and said, look, why don't you do something with this? It's oh, crazy. So it was a friend of you. Go, 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 I didn't even idea. know the person wasn't a friend yet. She was a stranger. And she oh, came, right. and she said, look, she put me in touch with her sister, Helen Lowe, in North Wales. And Helen designs body care products. So we experimented with lavender distillation. I'll take you to the still and show you in a minute. And uh, we made a, a line of body care products based on a very small amount of lavender oil that we produced. And Helen designed these creams for women. And I, will, I, I, I won't go on and on and on, but mm. these creams were not successful. They were gorgeous. Uh -huh. But there was a, they were branded. I had a, a, they did, the brand did not really tell what they were okay and I was starting to learn as people weren't buying them very much that I've got a problem I and I, in terms of the packaging the oh, that's a total problem we've got now we've invested in a still we're making oil we're making products but we're not making sales mm -hmm. I mean you know it, it's like it's, it's scary when you realize you've got this thing you love and no one's buying it and then I had this aha experience when I was invited to address a local, um, the Y Valley Grasslands Association. These are local farmers, like proper sheep farmers who are working dawn till dusk in all conditions. It's re it's a hard, hard work. Lovely life, but yeah, in a way, but hard, hard work. work. Yeah. And I passed around the ladies' creams that we were making just as to show what we were doing mm -hmm. because there were some women in the audience. But the men, the farmers, were putting my creams on their face and hands and afterwards coming up to me and saying, look, now my hands don't smell like silage which is the smelly stuff they produce here right. uh, on the farm in winter. Anyway, I was absolutely thrilled. And they were very... So you saw that there was an, a demand uh, yeah. for, for, from the, from these farmers yeah. who, were, who, who had rough hands and uh, yes. were very dry hands. Yes, and that and night, and 2012, one night, January, February, I was driving back home, miserable weather, up this single track road, and I thought... That's surprising. Yeah, I thought to myself, farmer's hand cream, I wonder if anybody in the world... Mm -hmm. 
has oh, farmer's hand so cream. So you found a niche. Yeah. An unexploited niche in the market. Yeah, Very good. yeah, yeah. But you, you know, know what? Actually, this is the what I offered to my uh, to my uh, be, be bed and breakfast lady from Hay on Y. The, the, uh, the, 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 the hand cream? The hand cream. Well, thank you. So that was uh, my first bottle. Oh, thank you. Oh, that's so yeah. sweet. You see, this is... She doesn't have a dishwasher, so you know you get some dry dry yes. hands because of all yeah. the uh, washing and washing very, the dishes. Very kind of you. I think and this is I think our brand grows because of people will say, "Here's a pot of this hand cream," and then you yeah. hear. But I wanted to tell you, yeah. I did not understand the brand. I had the idea. I have the tractor on the top, of, like a, a, a photograph of the tractor on top of a prototype tin, and it was Tyler when asking me casually one day, "How's it going?" He had nothing to do with my business at all. I said, well, I've got this idea. It's not going very well, but I've got this idea for farmer's hand cream. He loved the story. And he said, I think this is, this is going to be great. You can put the other brand aside. Maybe Which it, one brand? The one that no one was buying. Oh, like, right, I yeah. had the one that... And, the um, cosmetic products that you did with your friend, what was her name? Hel well, Helen. Uh, Helen, Helen Lowe was still making... St I had, Helen, Lowe. Helen, Helen and I are still in. I'm still a team. Yeah. So we just... But, but now we had farmers, had, and Tyler, it was Tyler who said, look, this is not going to be for farmers. I mean, great if they if they use it, but yeah. this is going to be other people. It's and people. I soon, soon learned it was people who really appreciate the countryside, maybe yeah. would like to be in the countryside. Mm -hmm. Or come to the countryside. Or, yeah, or, fast, or yeah. fantasize that yeah. they're country people. Who knows? But they're, that sounds a bit rude, but they're yeah. people who... Like, but it's the font. It's the feel of the tin. Yeah. It is definitely the product. It's gorgeous. The tin, yes. But it's good. Um, it's all those things. Yeah, as well. Yeah. And my creams before were in glass jars with kind of not very attractive. Lids were silver and quite nice looking, but a bit sharp. And I, uh -huh. and the labels were girly with flowers on them. And it was for women. And I, yeah. and farmers is for everybody. I love yeah. that. Yeah, there's a, there's a sort of, I agree with you with the packaging. There's a sort of utilities um, side to it with a tin. You know, a very um, minimalistic approach to yeah. your your design of the logo, which has been strip, uh, streamlined to the mm -hmm. to the basic, which is very clear. The name also farmers, um, so it's utilitarian and, and as yeah. well as very cute um, and um, clear, minimalistic. Clear. Exactly, clear. it gives a very clear message. And I agree with you. You're definitely exploiting a brand in the market. In, uh, sorry, a niche in the market, which is you know, it's sort of. Uh, lavender, very rich cream, which yeah. is so good for, for for hands. Did you? Just, that is that's Tyler's agency. Went, right. went creative. Right. Came up with that design. And I mean, I they they knew what to do with my photograph of the mm -hmm. tractor and to turn it into an illustration. And yeah, oh, they, so they they added a lot of value to your business. They did it. Yeah. They, yeah. Yeah. yeah, everything. Um, I, I just would like to backtrack a second um, uh, on, in relation to the um, the lavender films and the idea, because did you, uh, to conceptualize this, before you actually launch yourself into uh, planting the fields of lavender, did you, I, I, I did some, I googled uh, some of the biggest, um, uh, the top lavender fields in Europe, and of course there's Grasse, which is the, uh, uh, I think, world, world capital of perfume, Yeah, uh, where I actually go from time to time to make my own perfumes. I've got one for the South of France, where I've got the flat, where one for London, and the next one I will do it will be for Paris. So every time I select some ingredients. But having said that, though, because I go to Grasse, and it's also a place in the world where um, some members of my family go, so I go there quite quite um, during the holidays. I saw that there were lots of lavender fields. Did you and your husband went there to have a look? So did you go there to have a look? And later we did. Later, later. We, didn't, we didn't go before. After we went later, later. and um, we went someplace in Provence, and not really to the heart of it because we okay. stupidly went to the wrong part of. In France and had to drive too far but I did go and see what they do and it was just I mean there were farmers with millions of plants and we have yeah I don't know two and a half acres yeah yes it's, it's, so it was it's different but I saw what they did and I learned from them and I yeah. was really was really thrilling yeah and and so and also there is another very top <coughs> in there's, a, there's also a, 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 one of the top um, lavender fields in, in, which is actually in the UK and it's uh, it's um, in Banstead, not far from London. It's called Mayfield yeah. Lavender. The biggest. Right. Yeah, in Europe, I think. That's yes, right. Yes. Did you go to visit that one? No, but I've met them. I met the owner at a trade show last year. Uh -huh. And she was actually interested. So after? In after you did oh, all yeah, your yeah, stuff? Yeah. But no, yes. But I, I had a lot of help from people out there. When I was doing the research, you can imagine, reading, internet, telephone. Sure. And um, Alistair Christie of Jersey Lavender, he's now sold the business, helped me enormously over the phone via email and Bill and I went to visit him on Jersey and to okay. thank him. Um, okay. So, yeah. Because it's a totally different climate. Yeah. Growing up some lavender fields in, in glass yeah. where it's fairly, yeah. you know, dry 
especially yeah. uh, say April onwards, and here where it's yes. much more wet, wet and cold. Well, and no one had grown it in Wales. I mean, we were the first. Right. We, we brought well, we brought the lavender industry to Wales. We can actually say that we were the first to <laughs> grow it on a field scale. And as a result of our lobbying, my husband's lobbying, the Welsh government recognises it as an agricultural crop now, and at first did not. So that's something. Really? That's and several thing. others have planted fields now. Uh, you know, there's a field to the north of here, and there's one to the east of here, and mm -hmm. a couple of others coming up, I think, in South Wales. And what you were saying that because the terrain is in uh, um, steep, is steep. That's right. So it means that there's natural drainage. Yeah, um, that helps a lot. Yeah, it doesn't. You know, it's it's it is our location is not the right place for this. Really, I know that's hilarious. Okay, because we're doing it and we're succeeding, but we have lots of losses some years. Some years not too bad. We've had a couple of really bad um, springs in the last five years where we've lost, you know, one year maybe a thousand plants. And oh. you know, so why? We're just too wet, even though we do have drainage. Okay. Too soggy. Okay. And, and what happens is... Because I try to actually grow some lavender yeah. in my... Yeah. Uh, like to at least keep them in, in life, you know, some lavender plants that, uh, that I buy uh, in yeah. some nurseries on my balcony in London, but then I never managed to make them survive, really, although I really tried to look after them. But while the geraniums are totally fine and so yeah. sturdy, the lavender I buy, they never managed, I never managed to look after them properly. Do you so know what variety, what variety you're buying? Oh, goodness, you're not buying those things with the fancy little flowers on the sides of the spikes. No, I don't. I don't There's some that kind of look like butterflies. And also, I, 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 you know, I varied just to make sure that I, I yeah. give some several attempts. But, yeah. uh, so, um, don't water them. Right, okay. You don't want to water them. Okay. This summer, this past summer, the famous drought of 2018, um, we had 20% more oil per basket than ever before. Wow. Lavender loves a drought. Okay. So we were the only farmers for miles around who were happy about it. Um, Good for you. Yeah, it was, well, it was exciting just to see the science in action because I knew or understood from reading that that was the case. And at last, we had that. So what does it mean for you, fantastic, what does it mean for you that it is quite classified as a, an agricultural crop uh, in Wales, the, the, the lavender, does it give you some, I don't know, tax? Uh, you know, do you know, I don't even know the answer to it. I just okay. know that Bill was all puffed up that we've been recognised. Okay. So it, I, I, I don't think we get... Um, I, I can't imagine we get some sort of maybe, money benefit, but maybe you've got some discounts or, or you know, tax. Uh, tax I could check, but stuff, I, I don't. But, uh, I don't think so. But okay. Well, that's that's maybe, maybe there's some a fantastic uh, achievement though. To uh, I, I see caps looking around for me. Do you mind if can, can we second. pause? Yeah. Let me just tell them. I thought I could get away with it. No worries. Hey, caps! Caps, were you looking for me? Okay. Oh, great. I'm just doing an interview near me back. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 for near me back. No, we are. Question number I'm 10. <laughs> You're lovely to talk with. You're a good listener. Oh, thank you. That's very kind. <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, thanks. Um, did it, did it, did it. So, you were saying that you have this very productive partnership with your friend, Helen Low, low. Sorry. Um, how did you convey the news to her that you needed to be more, um, perhaps more uh, unisex in your approach to the product, and also um, more sort of utilitarian, even in the, the use of product, and uh, get out of the sort of uh, you know ladies focused cosmetic sort of thing. Even, even yeah. actually your, your Eau de Cologne, your perfume, even your Eau de Cologne is unisex, right? Yeah, we never use the word unisex, by the way. But yes, it's, course, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just, yeah. well, just one of those words. No, no, it's just <laughs> one of those words. It just, but, but everybody's people, I mean, I just love that the brand is just sitting there and it's for anyone. Yeah. Very occasionally, very occasionally I'll have some, maybe some lady say she doesn't want a tractor on her bathroom shelf with her face. Seriously? Or, well, twice, I think, in... Just seven years. So I think I think we've got a an attractive tin jar for most people. Uh, but no, Helen is Helen is great. I mean, she she just thought the tractor was a great idea. Okay. Um, one of she was on board. No, and two two of the products that we had in the other brand, we've brought right over and just changed the name to Farmers, okay. which you can do. They which would, are what the, lip balm? the scrub and the lip balm. Okay. Yeah. The scrubs. That I've got already such as a dry skin. I'm not using scrubs. Scrubs very moisturizing though. You could try it. Oh, okay. I mean, if you if you um, if you 
ever need to because your hands are really rough dear or this morning i i used some on my face mm -hmm. and it's not drying you want to use your face cream afterwards uh -huh. but um it's 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 very moisturizing okay and so those the set the sense with those two products was abs completely acceptable to men i gave it to some boyfriends to try and to give me their opinion you mean male friends yeah right yeah and and actually I th that was that was a question I, do you see a difference in terms of um who buys what do you see for example men buying more uh via the hand cream or i don't see men buying lip balms right yeah all the time tons do of they? lip balm they buy tons of it men yes like heterosexual men yes yeah, well, I don't Sorry. usually ask people about their <laughs> inclination. Um, no, they, they are, we have, we're too, we, 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 really? we yeah, but, yes. yes. we need to do some proper research because everything I'm telling you is just sort of from my gut and online orders and there's yeah. a lot of guys buy our foot cream. Mm -hmm. um, but the lip balm, when I first was showing that to the buyer for Ace Hotel, he loved the jar. Just yeah, love the, jar, the little jar, and I think it's quite acceptable for what, men that little ointment jar. And what do you put in it? Because there still seems to be some wax or something. Or Lavender, it? lime, honey from our bees. Honey, yes. And there's yeah, there's beeswax in there. Uh -huh. It's the only product that's not vegan. Our creams are all vegan. Okay. Just by the way. But I know I love the the, the lip balm. So men buy that. Okay. Yeah. Plus the foot uh, cream. Okay. Yeah, and well, face cream. I've got men face. buying our face cream. The products are for for people. They're not overly scented at, at all we don't add lavender any scent really it's the natural really yeah like if yeah. you smell the scrub it's lavender geranium um oh. frankincense a few other things as well but the geranium dreams kind of a, a fresh smell mm -hmm. right it's yeah. not a very girly it's a smells like the earth almost to Do me you know, I'd, actually i added in my uh, perfume which i called swinging london when i made it in this summer um in the south of france in grass as oh, i was wow. saying yeah. yeah if you go to the uh, uh perfumerie uh, gallimard you can actually make your perfumes i've added a little bit of tomato oh it's how amazing, it, is it interesting wow well, i love that yeah um, wow that was, that's, that's, that's because i eat a lot of tomato <laughs> yeah, I, tomato is my favorite thing yeah well, if, if there was can. one food yeah it would be that Right. And we grow them massively in the summer here. Okay, well, I can. The smell is really, really gorgeous. It's gorgeous and also very different. Yeah. Some people like it, some people yeah. don't like it. Earthy and, and fruity. It's so, I know the smell, it's lovely. Yeah. Sometimes you. In fact, when I'm buying tomatoes, I always smell yeah. the you know the bag if yeah. it's a winter and there's holes in the bag. Even a bit. Uh, on a vine. I'd like to make sure there's a nice smell in there before I buy them. It is extremely different from yeah. anything else I've been selling. And a lot of people tell me, wow. So, um,. Okay, um, was it, it's, it's a bit of a technical question, but yeah. I'll ask it anyway. Was it difficult to get the cosmetics and the perfume in compliance with the EU cosmetic regulation, which came into force in, 2000, in July 2013, in terms of rechanging some stuff on the packaging and naming your person who reports to the EU in case yeah. of no, issues? No, easy. I mean, all the, that's, there's an online site you go to okay. to register your product. I put a photograph of it and answer all these questions okay. and at first it looks completely frightening but it's absolutely easy and quick okay. you just reminded me i think we might not have put our face cream on there yet um <laughs> but i i, <laughs> I, 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 from I know but i learned it's it's a well actually it's, it's a fair point because i think the face cream i never saw before so it probably is a new new product right? it is the newest product ah there you go uh, but no that stuff's easy you know the, but there's very good regulations from the eu yeah. directives so every product we have is uh, challenge tested they take it and they put bad things into it like salmonella and really? all kinds of bacteria oh, they test and it. they see if your preservative can ward off those uh, bugs because they want to make sure that your product you know your hand might be dirty it goes into the pot mm -hmm. and you put the lid back on but if you they want to make sure your product won't um, be affected by that right you can stand up to a bit of abuse so we pay for those tests and we also have a test called um wow stability so you you give them your product in 10 tins or, or whatever the jar is and then they freeze it thaw it heat it leave it in a window leave the lid off they keep it for months and they, they come back and tell you your product is stable or not right so we do that did you have to make some adjustments to the formulas we did when we did our body lotion we just tweaked it in some small way further to receiving the feedback. yeah but there was there not there was nothing wrong on the on the challenge but on the okay. pack i think maybe 
we thought it should just have a little, I can't remember whether it was, it had, we had too much essential oil or not enough or something, but it was a minor thing. It wasn't a worry thing and it was easy just to do it and, and do it again. And in fact, the pack people who do the testing right. didn't, said we didn't even have to, but we did. Okay. Because we just wanted yeah, no, to no, make double, right. double sure. Absolutely. By the, by where the way, are they based? Who? Sorry. These people? Yeah. We'll do the testing. Oh, they're here in the UK. I think. Yeah, we don't have to send them anywhere. Sorry, you we use. Uh, I was just going to say, by the way, yeah. we do have a small line of products without lavender. Just wanted to say that okay. because well, we I love have a, Yeah, well, I love my lavender products too. But we want it, We we have a wonderful relationship with Ace Hotel in Shoreditch, London, right. Right. and we were when we were invited to put our products in their rooms in the bathroom mini bar. Cool. People buy them. Uh, we thought we should have a choice. What if someone says I don't want lavender or whatever? Some guys still think lavender is for ladies. Most guys know now. Okay. Um, so we made a little uh, line of things we call our perky scented line with eucalyptus and lemongrass, bergamot, rosemary, what is peppermint. It? What does it mean, perky? Perky. Upbeat, uplift, upbeat. Okay, okay, right, right, Wake right, right, me up. Okay, okay. Have a sniff. Wake okay, up. Okay. <laughs> it heightened the sen senses. But is it only for the Ace brand? Or no, no, we sell it too. Our body lotion, our salt, so our salt soak has no lavender. Did you think it did? Uh, the salts, no. Salt so lotion. Do you need to take your no. eyes, guy? Okay, no, sorry. my it's my husband. He's put his hat on and he's wandering around outside. I'm sorry, <laughs> it's fine. Um, salt soak bath. Uh, lo lo never mind. Salt soak body lotion wash. Our all over wash and our awake balm are all lavender free. What do you mean all over wash? Oh, for all over. The, yeah, that thing uh, in the pump. Yeah. What our wash? You've seen it in it. Bottle. Yeah, I need to change this one out during the Monaco Christmas Fair. Uh, you, you're going to be there? We'll be there next week. Yeah, oh, that's right. Oh, yes. Yeah. Will you be there? Will you come by? I'll, I'll do Try. my best. Yeah. I think I've got a, 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 a German girlfriend coming to town. Oh, it would okay. be nice to take her because it's a bit of a, an outing. I've tried last year, but uh, she, no. she, was on an, she had an agenda. Yeah. Um, um, <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, this is my last question, really. In terms of how do you see the future of a brand evolving? Do you want to grow it overseas? Do you want to strike more partnerships to have more brand recognition? Because it seems to me you've got a very solid product, a very well-defined brand now, and um, and also, um, uh, you know, line of products. So if you can share those news with us, what would be for you your ideal next steps in terms of the next two or three years? Over the past year, we have begun to try very hard to look at our figures and find out, which we've learned a bit about forecasting, and able to look and see, oh, we're better than we thought we were two months later in such a, you know, we, you know forecasting, because you're yeah. a lawyer, you know about these sorts of things. So we're trying to be more methodical and to see where our weaknesses is, are and our strengths are. Wow. And we are... Uh, tr we were trying to do that thing that I think all businesses must be striving to do, which is have more money to always, you know, instead of all the money in and all the money out. Mm -hmm. you know, we spend a fortune right, to yeah. make creams and then we sell them and make a fortune, spend a fortune. Make so we're, we're looking to so there are lots of increase our profit so that we have okay. more flexibility. I mean, I've showed you we're building that thing out there for people to stay in. We're building two visitor toilets as well, washrooms, okay. Okay. which... You know, we people come here, they flock here in the summer and they're queuing outside my husband's study for the loo. So we you know, we need we need a, we need to fix you. that. So next summer we'll have that. Yeah. We'll have a guest I don't I'm not sure I would want to share my loo's with uh, with some of strangers but Well it's okay and there's one downstairs that isn't our own private one, so it's it's okay. But we're um but it's just things like I think that's what we're trying to do and I there uh, there is another product I want to develop, but I want I we want to Watch closely how we're growing, where we're growing, where is our weakness, where is it our strength. It might make sense to go to some trade shows as well. To, we you know, we to did our first last year and we're right. going again. Whereabouts? Uh, top drawer at Olympia. We'll be there in January. Okay, right. And, we and the one in Paris as well. Oh, we'd love to go there. All the buyers are Ma coming. Maison Objet? Yes, that's, you've got Maison Objet, but you also have the, um, in particular, there is a fashion slash cosmetic trade show called Tranoi, which is in Paris, huh. where most of the buyers from all over the world yeah. come yeah. and um, and usually they don't really do business with French brands they actually buy from brands which are here and they are from yeah. all over the world and yeah you've got the big you know buyers from uh, Maison uh, sorry, Gare Lafayette yeah. Yeah. Uh, from, yeah. uh, from uh, 
uh, Harvey Nichols, um, uh, Prêt à Porter, Net à Porter, sorry, etc. Coming. So uh, Paris is really the um, the um, uh, center for this, the center for 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 international buying for cosmetics, I think, and uh, and also uh, fashion. Mm -hmm. So uh, Olympia, let me like, like for example, I've got some contacts or clients who are from the US, uh, from New York, and they would never do a show in, in Olympia. Uh, like pure or, or the one you just mentioned, they but they will always do for every three four months. They will do always the Paris ones. Okay, so I I think that you're right. We need to go there. Top drawer was our first. We spent a fortune to go there, yeah. but we got it all back very quickly oh, good. in lots of shops. Okay, and Paris is probably three or four times as expensive. I see. So we just built. I think it's time to really get that on my, our radar for next year. So you're looking at developing the wholesale aspect of the yeah, business. Yeah, so she's yeah. got the money, is, to yeah. be fairly honest. Yeah. yeah, that and also, as you were saying, yeah, about partnerships with hotels. And yeah, I mean, we would, we love Ace. Fantastic. We love Ace, and we'd like to maybe squeak into another Ace. We'll wait and see. Yeah. We'd like that. Okay, so you've got, yeah, because then you would get your retail business, but you get also other, um, uh, basically, uh, avenues to make money, yeah. uh, revenue, revenue yeah. streams, yeah. coming from the wholesale, the uh, partnerships with hotels and other brands oh that sounds really yeah, exciting thank you good good okay well i want to take more of your time you know and you're a very busy lady thank you so much nancy i thank you it's my pleasure annabelle thank you. thank you thank you for listening to our podcast lawfully creative produced by crefovi studios subscribe to our podcast or catch up with our original shows on itunes spotify stitcher youtube google podcasts soundcloud castbox tune in Breaker, Radio Public, Anchor, Pocket Casts, The ABA Journal, Player FM, iHeartRadio and Overcast. Please do leave a 5 stars review and rating about our podcast to encourage others to discover our curated content.